Welcome back to the OPEX podcast where fitness is explained. I am your host, Robbie Burke, and I'm joined on today's show by Nick Fowler from Brute Strength and Massive Athletics. On this episode, Nick and I discuss many topics, including Nick's background and his influences. I asked Nick what are the good and not so good things that he currently sees within the fitness coaching profession and what solutions would he offer for the not so good things that he currently sees. I asked Nick about his training philosophy. Guys, this was an excellent conversation with Nick. It's jam-packed full of information. I know that you're going to love it. Stay with us. Nick, thank you so much for making time today. I really, really do appreciate it. Just for the listeners who may not be too familiar who you are, just give us the background. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on, Robbie. Um, yeah, what, what's my background? So um, we can start where I'm at right now. I currently coach a lot of high-level games athletes. I'm a strength and conditioning. Um, oh, the head of strength and conditioning for Brute Strength. I also own Massive Athletics, which is a kind of a gym training facility here in Salt Lake City, Utah. And yeah, that's kind of what I do. I focus on um, developing uh, kind of high level athletes on, on with this idea of athlete development as a whole, right? So mindset, kind of a holistic approach, if you will. Um, and, and where I've come from, man, that's a, that's a, we could get into the the weeds with that, but I got introduced to to CrossFit in, gosh, the winter of 2007, and so that was a little bit ago. Things were different. Uh, I got introduced to essentially the online dot com. Somebody was like, "Hey, you got to go check this out," and that really kind of introduced me and sparked my interest with, uh, you know, CrossFit and and that whole. Um, I wouldn't say new methodology. I mean, it, it was something that I had never been exposed to in, in that fashion. I, I know that uh, you talked to a lot of other high level strength and conditioning coaches and, and they were uh, doing pieces of it or had pieces of it for many, many years without it kind of being formally like brought together in, in a systematic approach. But prior to that, um, my, my uh, athletic background, I, I grew up playing uh, some football. Lacrosse was my, was my main sport. Uh, loved it still to this day. I uh, wish I could, I wish I was a younger version of myself. I could go out and run around, but I'd probably kill myself. Um, and then uh, shortly after uh, kind of late um, 98, 99, got into climbing and long story short, um, kind of that's what I ended up doing. I ended up uh, guiding uh, and, and climbing professionally for, for many years, working with like search and rescue in Yosemite National Park um, living in places like Chamonix, trips to uh, the Himalayas, Baffin Island, Patagonia, things like that. And so that, that became a real passion of mine where uh, my goal was to climb these, these giant, uh, I don't know, these, these giant technical uh, mountains. You know, you can think about, um, you know, having uh, something like 2K or, you know, uh, spend some time um, over there like Gashabram 4. Um, climbing out there in the Himalayas. And, and so that, that was, uh, that was a big uh, part of me getting into and becoming interested in the strength and conditioning world from, from, a, from, from myself, right. Realizing that some of my goals and my aspirations at the time, uh, outpaced my physical ability. Um, and just recognizing like, man, like if I want to start doing some of these things and, and, and this is my goal, then, I really have to take it seriously because my life is on the line, right? Having some close calls myself and, and having uh, friends die and, and just being part of that, that community, realizing that, you know, physical preparedness um, is, is sometimes a matter of life and death, right? Getting to the top of the mountains, only half the, half the journey, you got to get back down kind of thing. So um, that, that kind of led me into um, finding out a little bit about Mark Twight. Um, at the time he had a book, um, it was called, um, Oh man, what was the name of it? It was a classic book. I think it was like um, basically a, a light and fast uh, book about technical climbing in the mountains, right? And so in there, um, he had some bits and pieces about training. And so that's that's essentially uh, in 2001, um, that's when I really started to say, okay, like how am I going to do this? I'm just starting to kind of search out um, information, mentors, you know, systems to kind of yeah, basically get me as resilient as possible that's, that's a super interesting uh, background so have you 
ever thought about going to like K2 or Everest? Yeah, I, um, there was, there was, um, uh, no, not really, honestly, Everest is, is, uh, I always thought about it as, as, as just kind of a big hill. I mean, it's an incredible accomplishment, right. To get to the top of Everest, but, um, even back, uh, in, in the early two thousands, it was still kind of this, um, commercialized, uh, experience. Um, I was, I was, I had a short stint up there on the search and rescue team, um, you know, for about four or five weeks where we kind of did a little bit of a, a shift. Um, so I was able to kind of play around on the mountain, but no, my, my, uh, my interest was all, was on like, uh, more technical, yeah, um, yeah. bigger, bigger mountains, if you will. So you're not like, you weren't one of those like crazy fuckers who like, just like hung off, like the faces off cliffs with like no protective gear. Yeah, that, that was me. Not, not to the extent I'm sure you've seen like Alex Honnold, uh, new, new movie called, uh, uh yeah so, uh, free solo coming out but oh, that, if, if, if you haven't you got to go check that out it's it's i think it's just coming out in the next couple of weeks but um yeah like i did some uh when when i i spent a lot of time in yosemite national park and cl- ended up climbing uh, a lot of uh a lot of el cap um and i had some ascents where it was uh mostly ropeless wow wow and just, uh, I'm fascinated by that now. Just like, can you, can you explain like what, what sensations are going through your body during those moments? I mean, it's all something I've actually wanted to ask people who, who do that. Like, cause, uh, like I'm fascinated about it. You've probably seen that movie too, Man on Wire. You know, he walks across the World yeah. Trade Center. Like stuff like yeah. that is just like, yeah, you're just like, what the fuck? It's just unbelievable. So yeah. yeah, can you, can you put into words at all? What, what's, what's going through the body and the mind? Yeah, my experience at the time, you know, I always had friends and family just uh, equated to like, oh, it must be this like adrenaline rush, right? And that's what I was seeking. And it it was something completely different. Um, Mm -hmm. I never, I I never had like a rush, right? Um, Only when, when something bad was happening and it was not good, right? So if that ever actually came up, it was something (laughs) that wasn't supposed to um, be there. And it was something that that wasn't good. Right. Um, the, the best way I can, I can describe it. Um, and it, and it's been highlighted more recently is is this sensation of just being in the moment, right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, uh, the rise of Superman is a great book and it talks about flow, the state of flow, the scientific um, mind, mind state. And, and that's, um, you know, I read that years and years after all my experiences, but I, I, I think that that, is is probably the closest thing to it it was this kind of meditative in the moment mm-hmm. um flow state where n- everything kind of dropped away and and i was just able to do what i love without um any kind of clear emotions or thoughts around it if that makes sense i mean the mm-hmm. things i did with the mindset that i did them w- was was pretty amazing um but i never thought it was amazing at the time if that makes sense yeah, yeah, man. I could, I could talk more to you or ask more questions about yeah. that, but uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll stick to more of the topic today. Which we can always have you back on, or we can always have more time to chat. But um, yeah. influences. I always ask the guests to come on who've been their biggest influences, and and I always make it a, a two pronged question. So, who've been your biggest influence, Nick, both professionally and then also personally? Yeah, man, that's a that's a good question. I think. Um, there's just so many people uh, and milestones along the way. I think that I look at my life in, in, in a series of stepping stones of chapters, right. And each one's been like layered onto itself. Um, you know, professionally is the easy one. Uh, you know, when I got in, obviously like Mark Twight, Poliquin, Charles Poliquin, um, you know, Dan John, like those are some of the early influences for me. Um, and then getting into, you know, CrossFit, you know, probably as a whole, right. So you could probably, um, you know, kind of put a whole bunch of people into that, um, that bucket, but that, that definitely influenced me and, and, and had a big, uh, big impact on the direction of my life for sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, a couple, couple most recent ones that come to mind is, uh, well, James Fitzgerald, right. Um, OPT, OPEX, OPT at the time, <clears throat> I ended up, 
kind of finding out, getting introduced uh, 2010 when he had just moved down to Scottsdale, right? And so um, participated in the CC, one of the original like CCP programs, which was which was amazing. Um, you know, and then uh, you know Max El Hajj uh, with Training Think Tank, like um, you know, spent some some years with him. He he lived out here uh, in Salt Lake City for a while, and then um, I think most recently, just when I think about my current like the current people that I actually interact with, um, you know, with, at Brute we have this high this collection of high level thinkers, right, and. The beautiful thing about that is that I have access to um, almost, you know, experts, mentors, friends, you know, on a, on a weekly, daily basis, right? And so, you know, Mike Cashew, uh, Matt Bruce, Sean Pastouche, uh, you know, Nick Sorrell in gymnastics, and then just um, even like um, Matt Torres, who's uh, one of my coaches, like just fantastic brains and experiences kind of combined with a passion of, of sharing and becoming a perpetual student. And so, <clears throat> you know, it's, 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 I'd love to say, Oh, like this is, this is that one person, but um, you know, I think all of us, we go through life and we get influenced by so many different people and end up molding us a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, and then in my personal life, the, you know, uh, I just, it just kind of came to me. I think that the biggest influence in my personal life is my kids the hecticness of, of, of a home with, with uh, two young daughters, but it's more from a perspective standpoint where <clears throat> just my perspective shifted in life and kind of what's important. And then understanding that, um, you know, to be a teacher, to be a mentor, to be a father, right. To, to um, yeah, just ex like see somebody grow up um, has just been one of probably the, the biggest like life altering experiences, right? In a good way. I remember when my daughter was born, uh, Tessa, <clears throat> like 10 years ago, in, uh, in, you know, in the hospital, she comes out and I remember uh, seeing her, right? Just whatever, five minutes old. And, and, I, and I could almost feel my perspective changing. Like it was just such a awe inspiring moment that I've, I've really never experienced. It was something that like, I was legitimately speechless. And it was like, you know, people describe like birth as a miracle. And that's probably the closest thing, even though miracles kind of thrown around as a generic term these days, like that moment right there changed my life for, you know, forever. Uh, and you've two daughters, have you? <clears throat> yes, yeah. How, how old is your second more different. How old is your second daughter? <laughs> Uh, seven and ten, so seven, seven years old, and then yeah, ten. So. Oh, sorry. So you're you're. Uh, I was just I was just wondering if 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 like that you're because you said that your first daughter was ten, so I knew that she she was old enough, but I didn't know how young the other one was because a lot of my friends right now they're <laughs> they're all having babies, so they're all like usually two years yeah. and younger. So a lot of them are very sleep deprived. But I'd say you're you're well past that stage now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Probably sleep deprived for other reasons, but um, <laughs> self inflicted. Uh, yeah, those <clears throat> the like. First couple of years are, are rough, man. That tells you tells you about uh, yeah how valuable sleep is and and all that good stuff, right? Yeah. In, in terms, then, just before we move on to our next question, uh, just with, with your daughters, like um, in terms of instilling a sort of active and healthy lifestyle, how have you gone about that? Yeah, it's it's a good um, man. That's a good question. It's something that like my wife and I, uh, Annie, we always kind of talk about and brainstorm, right? So like, um, I think well, one by leading by example, right? Yeah, um, yeah. By by trying to, I don't know, cook decent meals, talk about like why we're eating, what we're eating, making a point to sit down. I mean, we sit down every night or you know, 99% of the time we're like have sit down meals, um, you know, talking, yeah, just talking in general about why, you know, why nutrition is important, what portions of nutrition are important. And then also um, there's also the, the, the physical component, right. Staying active. Um, you know, one thing we're, I'm looking forward to is in, in January, we're going to go surfing for, for a couple of weeks. And so, Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. And so, um, you know, part of that is, 
you know, talking to my daughters and saying, Hey, like, let's, let's get fit, right. Let's get stronger. Uh, so we can enjoy that, uh, that trip even more. And, and so there's a little bit of buy-in now managing life and I don't know, routines and, and the logistics is, is always harder than, uh, than I, I would like it to be. But I think, yeah, by example, and just, um, you know, they're always at the gym, like, you know, the gym that I'm at. And so yeah, yeah. the first thing they do is they run in and they want to, you know, run on the, the air, air runner or <laughs> ring, ring rows or, you know, jump around and things like that. So, um, they're pretty active, but I think the the primary thing is their sports, right? Like yeah. making sure that there's time in their sports right now. Um, yeah. So, um, they both ski in the winter. Um, my youngest is, is kind of into gymnastics and, and singing music, piano, that sort of thing. And my oldest right. plays volleyball. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> I think through sport, right. That's where the, the kind of healthy, uh, activities can come in. And a big part of it is just also self-perception, right? Like I realize, and it's highlighted. If you think about a training session, a really, really hard training session, and the, the conversations that you might have with yourself, right, about doubt, about uh, failure, about success, and how erratic they can be, um, it really highlights the, the importance of kind of good self-talk, right? And so that, that's always the driving force for me when I think about my daughters, right? Yeah, great stuff. Um, one more general question, then we're going to get into talking all about training, the nitty-gritty, the stuff people want to hear about. In, yeah, in, yeah. Terms, in terms of the good and the not so good things that you currently see within like the whole fitness coaching profession in general, uh, what would you say are the good things that you see? And what would you say are the not so good things? And for the not so good things, Nick, what sort of solutions would you offer? So another way I've often worded this is what makes you proud to be a coach? What doesn't make you so proud? And with the stuff that doesn't make so proud, what sort of solutions would you offer there? Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. I think, um, so the good things about coaching, I think there's just a lot more information out there. Um, and obviously it's a double-edged sword and we can get to yeah. that here in a second, but um, there's, there's, there's nowhere to hide, right? Like you, you, are you, if you're not doing um, a good job um, and, and good is, is really subjective these days, but um, if you're getting people hurt, um, if you're not showing, uh, if, if you're one of your athletes, clients is not getting progress, um, there's not communication happening, like there's a million other options out there. For you, right and so um the ability for people to be more aware of um of what is acceptable and what's not acceptable i think is 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 a good thing right um there's a lot more literature out there um you know obviously books in the past 20 years have, have kind of come out um i think that this idea of the individual is starting to really take hold and realizing that um, one size doesn't fit all um, and that, you know, the, the, the sexy um, new thing might not be the answer. I think that that's becoming more of a, a common understanding, if you will. So I think like overall, I think there's just more out there, um, which allows for a little bit more self-regulation amongst the community, right? Now, when we talk about the not so good things, I think that the other side of that coin is that there's just so much stuff out there. Right. And it's really hard to understand and hard to know um, what's right for you as an individual. Right. Um, I think that because there's more out there and because it's so easy to become quote unquote a coach that now everybody's a coach and a self-proclaimed uh, trainer, coach, whatever it is, when you know maybe the the individuals that they're coaching right that they're communicating with that they're offering services to don't match their experience knowledge and expertise right now i'm, I'm a big fan because i started not knowing anything right like i started just going into a gym and trying to figure out what the hell um different things you know why i'm doing certain things and if i look back to you know my you know, what I was doing 20 years ago, I'd just, you know, shake my head and laugh, did, right? Did, did you use the Smith machine as well? I did. I did use the Smith <laughs> machine. Yes. Yeah. Probably yeah, yeah. not correctly. Uh, yes. <laughs> we, were, we were all there at one stage, but we were all there at one stage. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, <clears throat> that's why I think it's important not to 
uh, you know, demonize like, oh, new coaches and they don't know. No, you just got to, I think the big thing is that people are in a rush, right? I think yeah. people uh, want to be doing more than they're capable of doing. And there's nothing wrong with understanding where you're at and your limitations. And then, um, you know, coaching those people and referring other people on. Like, I mean, not too long ago, I, I referred somebody on, right? Like I had a, a, a pro strongman uh, lady. Uh, reach out to me and was like, Hey, like, I'm a, you know, pro strong man. Can, can, can you coach me? And I was like, I was like, no, I, I think I know of somebody who can do a better job. Right. Um, and, and I, yeah, I referred that, that person on. Right. And so it is a hard thing to do. Um, but I think that that's, that's the, that's the, the bad side of coaching. There's just so much out there. And I think um, it's, it's really easy. The chances of finding, uh, a bad fit is, is even better. Right. I think that, um, you know, from a, from a, from a training space as a whole, I think that people are trying to do, um, more with less meaning like group training programs and, um, you know, taking the focus from, I don't know, quality, methodologies implementation um ideas into the the shiny you know like fancy video that you're going to put with your program or whatever it might be right where at the end of the day like yeah those videos are really important but if we're talking about long-term athletic development i think that we're still pretty short-sighted as a whole in terms of like the fitness community right i think that um you know, people come in, in the gym and, and they have a wedding in 60 days and they want to get ready for it. And it's like, well, sure, that's a good goal. But this idea of like, OK, well, what happens uh, the day after your wedding? Like, are you just going to like just stop? Right. Like where where's the when we talk about true long term development like that's I think that's something that's short sighted within our community. Now, what you know, you ask a, a very good question, like what can be done about it? And I think that this is where I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say conflicted, but this is where it's tough for me, right? Because I, I realize that um, I have a lot of experience. I work with, I've worked with a lot of different people. Um, I've been successful uh, to a certain extent. And so to me, I realize like I have a, a responsibility to probably share that, if that makes sense. And, and to share what, what I've learned and what I know. However, I don't, I never feel like I'm ready, if that makes sense. And, and I think that um, I, I just don't ever quite feel like um, I know everything or I'm ready. And, and that's a good thing, right? Like in, in probably, you know, ask me 10 years ago and it was a big um, point of concern for me, right? Like, oh man, I'm not ready. I need to know more. Like I just need to spend some more time doing X, Y, and Z before I coach so-and-so or those, you know, that sport or whatever it is. And what I've realized is that um, to some degree, um, you know, you, you, as soon as you know, you think you know everything, you're, you, you're, you're probably in a very, very, you know, unhealthy spot. Right. So, so that's the conflict that I have is I think that just, I think if us coaches can honestly put out genuine content about, our failures and our successes that can slowly kind of start to shape and change some of the, um, yeah, some of the fitness space that, that we're in. Right. And, and that's one thing I think that, um, you know, CrossFit has done a really good job of highlighting, um, fitness and a different body type as sexy. Um, and so I think that that, that can be a good thing in terms of if you look at males and females uh, who, you know, don't have that slender size one petite figure, which I'd, I'd probably argue that, you know, 10, 15 years ago was, um, was kind of a driving force within a lot of people like losing weight, don't, don't want to get bulky, that sort of thing. And then I think that, um, you know, CrossFit has kind of, potentially like push that realm into saying like, Hey, there's more than, um, the physical 
that defines you and like you can still be sexy and and you know look a certain any way you want so um yeah so i i think that that's it you know i'm I'm, i've been for the past five six years i kind of actively mentor uh coaches and so that's something that I, i i try to do um you know i have i have someone right now who's moved from canada uh for the last for the next you know five six months and and he's kind of going through a mentorship program uh with me and and um that's something that's not really out there but you know that's something that i i try to do i mentors for me have been such a big part of where i'm at and what i've been able to accomplish and so you know i think giving back and and working individually quality over quantity is something that i'm trying to do and i think is valuable great stuff great stuff very detailed answer appreciate it um all right getting into the the meat and the potatoes as they say if i was to ask you the question what is your training philosophy uh what would you say yeah boy that's that's hard i think um i think uh, just a holistic um individual approach right um I don't think that uh, what I've realized is that the tools, meaning a back squat or Bulgarian uh, methods or, you know, German volume training or bodybuilding or, you know, traditional aerobic or high intensity, you know, wh- whatever the, the tool is, it needs to fit the person. Right. And so I think that an individual approach and consideration is, is first and foremost, if that makes sense. Um, and part of that individual is needs to be this holistic insight into um, why they're doing what they're doing, the emotions around um, their actions, um, and essentially establishing a relationship that allows them to reach their potential, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we could talk about all the details, but I think that's, that kind of sums it up. I think, you know, individual, but holistic at the same time. Mm. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Because the next question is then the system. So, cause I always, again, I suppose it's, it's another two pronged question. Whereas to me, like philosophy is your why, whereas the systems is then your how, like, so how do you put your philosophy into action? So my next question is then is, what is your training system? So I show up to your facility in Salt Lake and I'm like, right, I'm here. Let's rock and roll. So, you know, what's the assessment process like? What's the program design like? And then when all that's up and running, how do you monitor? Yeah, no, those are, that's, that's, those are exactly, uh, you know, pretty much the, the process, right? So you show up day one. The first thing I want to know from you is, um, is a little bit about, goals um and and obviously like hey what do you want to accomplish in the short term like a year from now but then three years five and then even 10 years like where do you see yourself 10 years from now i think is really really important and so you know Uh, that's and and nick could could i just ask a quick a a quick question sorry to sorry to cut across um do you find that that gets a lot of people off guard like when you start saying three and five and ten you know some people are like whoa geez i was just thinking like about the wedding in 60 days as you say yeah, I think that most people don't think past uh, three years. It's really unusual that someone has a three-year goal. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I think I think some people think they have a three-year goal, but it's really not defined yet, right? And yeah. so I think, um, yeah, when you ask about 10 years, it's like, man, I don't know. Like, people don't have an answer, right? Um, I might be alive in 10 years, man. Yeah, right? It's about now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Instant gratification. So, exactly um so sorry, which, can... which might not be a might not be a bad thing right like yeah, the 10, yeah, yeah. The 10 year goal thought might be a distractor uh on the the focus needed True. intensity needed right now but True. um yeah for sure and then and then i think just um like i think about trying to understand the person one of the one of the common conversations i have right off the bat so it, it starts with a conversation right and it starts mm-hmm. with um asking questions it starts with understanding um, how this person um, kind of lives within their life. Um, so I, I, a common conversation is I just say, hey, like, tell me about your day. Like, when do you, what time do you wake up? When do you eat? What do you eat? 
like just basically paint a picture from the start to the end of your day. And you can find out a lot about somebody just by saying, Hey, what did you do today? Mm. You know, or yesterday. And I think that that starts with, um, with really the, the basis for, for anything. Right. So it, the reason I do that is, is, is to understand a starting point. Right. So obviously where we're going in the goal and a starting point of like saying, Hey, where we are today, but more about resource available resources. Right. So if you think about myself, um, I don't have the resources needed to let's say commit to the Olympics. Right. Because I, I just don't, right. I, I don't have the time in the day to commit or I'm not willing, right. To change my life. Right. To basically have those resources to do it. Maybe it's money, right. Maybe, um, you need to be now traveling uh, to these sanctioned events if you want to qualify for the CrossFit Games, and maybe you just don't have the money, right? So you don't have the resource. And so kind of seeing where somebody's at and what they have available will, 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 is, is huge, right? Um, I think things like training age, I think like injuries, um, I just think about like biological age, um, these things definitely go into how and what we do with that person. Um, you know, and then from there, I, there's definitely like a physical assessment, right? So I want to understand um, if there's any mobility, movement, range of motion uh, limitations that, that is going to um, change uh, the, the workout prescription, right? Or the, the exercises that person do, does. And so um, I've seen elite, level weightlifters right competing at the world stage who have like almost zero scat mobility right and one of the biggest things is that if they do miss a jerk it's always out front and so you know you can kind of there's a lot of layers in between there and to connect those two it's, it's a pretty um you know that's a long distance but those two were connected for this person so like by doing a proper movement assessment you know seeing um, scapular mobility, right? Seeing that, um, that, that mobility, the required range of motion is, is I think a precursor. And it, what it does to me is it doesn't necessarily influence what I'm going to give that person. It influences what I'm not going to give that person. Right. And just like anything, right. The foundation of any pyramid needs to be, I think, in mobility, um, and, and structural balance. And so, that that's the second part for me as I look at structure, if there are any major structural imbalances, right? Left leg, right leg, mm -hmm. abduction, adduction, like just kind of general stuff that I think is, is, is pretty common knowledge, I guess, but maybe it's not, but I think understanding how somebody moves and if there's any dysfunction there needs to be addressed right away. So if, if a person has aspirations to become an elite athlete, top of their game, um, then, um, <clears throat> if that person is genetically gifted enough, then they might not need to deal with those structural imbalances, but they're going to pay a big price on injuries uh, and probably move in efficiency and potential down the road. And so I think dealing with that stuff um, is very, very important. A lot of times it's hard for people who are, you know, consider themselves the, the best of the best to go back to <clears throat> single leg, um, you know, banded clamshells to isolate glute sequencing and function, right? <clears throat> and so from there, understanding like somebody's numbers relative to their sport. So <clears throat> when I look at um, numbers and, and testing, I'm, I'm, over the years, I've gotten away from this big batch of testing. I used to, um, you know, if you came to me as a new athlete, I used to um, come to the table with, I don't know, two to four weeks of testing saying, okay, you know, we're going to test you. <clears throat> and those, those tests are definitely appropriate for, they, they would fit the person and that person's goals, right? So if someone's going to run wants to run a marathon, they're going to look very different than if someone wants to be an elite level power lifter, right? Um, now, some of those things might overlap, but the sport specificity, specific, like the, the specificness of the sport is going to influence the testing, if that makes sense. Good, so, good, good social shooter. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> um, so I think that the better way to go about it is I've, what I've found 
and even uh, at the best and the highest level athletes is that they're really untrained for the most part, unless they come from a very uh, intelligent coaching system or coach or individual that's prepared them, right? Usually, um, and this maybe goes back to a little bit of how you know, our, our culture as a whole is lacking is that I, I think that there's um, people don't understand what they're doing. So they try to do everything and a lot of it and just hopes that something sticks. Typically, if you have a gifted athletes, it looks like you're making progress and things are working when really like anything would have worked for that person. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that um, acclimating them to volume, um, acclimating them to <clears throat> movement patterns, and then once they're there, then testing them. And that testing can look like um, <clears throat> if I know on Tuesday mornings you're going to be, you know, anaerobic power uh, session, right? And so maybe, you know, after two, three weeks of like acclimating that person to intensity, volume, and load, that Tuesday, just one of those Tuesdays becomes an anaerobic power test, right? And then uh, after that week, I can maybe even put another one in the following week, but then I can revert back to anaerobic power training and it still fits within the skeleton uh, as a whole. And so that's something that I found that really, really works well, especially with um, higher level athletes, right? So like when, when I think about games athletes that I coach, um, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, the, a lot of them are, they have all the numbers and they have kind of, I don't know, for lack of a better term, all that data out in the world, if that makes sense. Now, some things like mobility and structural uh, strength and those types of pieces aren't necessarily there. And so it, the higher level athlete, you can be a lot, lot more specific in terms of like every year when you show up, these types of events is where you, um, where we need to focus on, right? They become priorities. And so then the question becomes, okay, well, what about those events? And then those kind of detailed testing can really kind of come into, um, yeah, come into to view, right? Of like, okay, what are we actually trying to improve, right? And then that, that kind of maybe gets down to a little bit about my style, right? I, I look at the pieces that we need to improve to improve the whole if that makes sense. And so like, mm. you know, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Right. And so if we have somebody, um, you know, I, I always use this example, but if like I say, Hey, like five people like get up and uh, do max set of pull-ups and they all do 20 pull-ups strict um, or even kipping, let's just say, um, then how do you like, what are we just going to do more pull-ups with every one of them? Right. Like why then the question becomes like, OK, well, why couldn't you get 21 pull ups? And what what I found over the years is that you have different limiters. Right. You have somebody with maybe a grip limiter, someone else with, um, you know, it could be um, a musk like a regional muscular endurance limiter. And then other person, it might be mental. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, there's there's many, many limiters. But understanding that piece is really valuable because if it is a grip limiter, like that can be layered into the skeleton. And rather than just doing more of something, you're going to be a lot, lot more effective if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Just um, a follow up question to sort of that in training testing that you touched on. It's funny. Um, Dan Pfaff gave this great lecture. It's uh, it's one he gave a long time ago for the Canadian coaches. Um, Canadian Athletic Coaches Center, I think it was, but it was it was up in Canada anyway. But it's what it's a famous lecture of his, and it's it's on Alta Three Sixty now. But he spoke about like he's like when to test. He's like, you know, I used to test in the load week, and he's like, but I used to get real inconsistent results. Then I started to test before the cycle. He's like, that was just as worse or just as bad. And he's like, then I started to test during the cycle, and he's like, then I started to get like a lot more consistent results. Um, so it's interesting that you you kind of you know say that you do something similar, but just a question that I personally have on that is: Do you actually tell the athletes that a test is coming up, or do you just don't tell them? And it's like it's like they just show up that day thinking it could be, as you said, an anaerobic power day, but then you just say, "Right, we're doing a test," or 
you just is, is it happened then and there or I suppose does it depend on the athlete if you know what their mentality is like you know some people like to know some people don't like to know yeah that's a great great question i i uh it really depends on the person right yeah, and that's yeah. i was thinking that would be that, the answer yeah, yeah yeah totally and that's like 90 percent of the time it is but here's here's the thing is that i think um you have um you have people who are architects in nature who who em- get empowered um by understanding why things are happening and when things are happening things yeah. like that and then yeah. you have um you know, other folks who, um, you know, are essentially kind of winners, right. Or drivers where it's just like, Hey, tell me what to do. And I'm going to go out and just do it. Right. Um, one isn't necessarily better than the other. I have seen, um, some athletes, well, there, there, I think there is a certain type to champions for sure. Um, and so I think that, um, Yeah, I think that overall, I don't, in general, I don't mention that there's testing coming up um, Mm. or that this is a test. Um, Some people know uh, just because it looks very different. Um, And then, um, but yeah, it really really depends. Uh, What I do a lot of times is, is that I hide testing within training um, to eliminate like an emotional response. Right. Yeah. So like, um, now, you know, all my athletes who listen to this might be like, Oh, that bastard. Right. So like anytime I give like a three, two, one, um, it's really kind of like just to get an indicator of that heavy single without making it a test. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 And just, sorry, I was just checking there. That was kind of bugging me. So it was, it was the Canadian athletics coaching center. The, that used to be the website anyway that used to host the, the video that Dan has but now it's on also 360 but uh, no it was just funny is it, when you said that about sort of in in training cycle testing so Dan kind of came to that similar conclusion yeah but he, he would just uh, I suppose another thing too that you can often use and I think even a lot of coaches who mightn't even realise you do this and they actually are is like key performance indicators so like even within your training so like Dan was saying that like you know, he, he would like, he'd monitor like overhead backward throws, like in terms of distance, like just, just during training, like you're just having a rough a gauge of how far they're throwing that, that, uh, that med ball. And like, you know, there was a correlation with that and like certain speed and indices, you know, so things like that, or, you know, again, like people might be just monitoring the power clean, like, you know, so if someone hits their best double on a power clean, you know, so you'll see certain like indicators within training. It might need to be a test just within the training. Certain things are, are continuing to go up. And so again, like looking at key performance indicators, whatever you've identified as your KPIs. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, so I think key performance indicators for me are, um, are improvements on limiters, right? So like um, I'm, I'm specifically mm-hmm. looking at, shifts in limiters right because so you're you're, that's you're what, actually that's what you're I'm targeting right you're so actually like, looking at improving key performance inhibitors yeah exactly that's a great way to put it well no um, i don't i don't take credit for that that's that so dan says kpi stands for two things it stands for key performance indicators but it also stands for key performance inhibitors so that's that uh, yeah, yeah. Dan Faf. Dan Faf's a genius yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah that's cool um yeah i mean i look at i look i because i'm trying to eliminate weaknesses right yeah, in, yeah. in most of the, the folks i do right everything else is going to kind of get better but if i'm not identifying uh the weak links or or the priorities that we need to work on then um i'm going to leave a lot on the table right mm-hmm. um and there's always going to be something in there that's kind of hidden and the, and the thing about inhibitors is that they bleed over into other things right yeah. so if you if you think and this is where assessing and testing is just so important to get accurate data and it's really hard, if not impossible, to get true, accurate data. Um, that if you interpret the results incorrectly, you're going to come up with a whole different theory, right? And potentially a whole different, um, like, you know, you're going to give them the wrong solution, right? So, like in the pull-ups, right? If I think that it's an aerobic limiter, when it's really a grip limiter, um, you know then you can just see how training is going to go in two different directions. Right. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, initial testing. I think that 
I've gotten to the point where I can see someone progress in, in a cycle without needing to know what their yeah. one rep max is anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's, what, that's what I was kind of getting at in terms of like Dan saying you could follow some trends in a train that are giving you indicators of where someone's at. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a healthier way. Cause if you, if you throw testing in true testing where you need to deload from that, you're, you're sacrificing, uh, you're definitely sacrificing some training time. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I primarily coach CrossFitters, uh, you know, high level CrossFitters in, in, in that space. And so what I've even found is that the individual tests aren't necessarily markers of that person's potential to win. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think about, yeah, right. You, you, the ability to put it all together, pacing, uh, you know, strategy, uh, just so many different things. When you show up on game day, like you can have all the best numbers in the world, but if you're not putting it together on game day, uh, you're not going to win. And so I think that what I, what I like to do is either set up environments that mimic, um, like game day or really use, um, competition as a way to remeasure actually what's going on. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's tricky. Yeah, it's tricky. CrossFit, right? CrossFit games, CrossFit athletes. Like we live in a space where, um, it's a bit unknowable sometimes. Yeah, it it is. Um, it's although it's getting a little bit predictable, and I think yeah. that's where for me, like focusing on the characteristics. If you focus on the characteristics, it becomes pretty predictable relative, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Like there, there's there are certain things that will always always show up in CrossFit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, you know, that, um, I don't know, like vertical, uh, regional pulling endurance. Right. So like, um, like basically, you know, you can think about kipping Mm pull-ups, even Mm -hmm. muscle ups, um, you know, even to some degree, uh, I would say that that maybe fits the obstacle course, uh, rope climbs, things like that. So it doesn't matter if it's a rope climb or with a bar, like, the characteristic that we need to improve, for example, would be like upper body, uh, vertical, like regional pulling endurance. And so it doesn't matter whether the tool, right, is X, Y, or Z. If we're improving those characteristics, then there'll be a a transfer or carryover. Yeah, exactly. Now, when we look at the like sports specific skills, like um, then that's different, right? Like the skill to actually climb a rope and get better at that rope. But, yeah yeah just um you touched on strengths and weaknesses there it's an interesting conversation you know because people bring up you know should i you know like how much do you focus on the strengths and how much do you focus on the weaknesses and a really good thing that you know i heard and, and learned from Stu mcmillan and, and again from dan faft is they would spend the earlier part of an off season really working on those weaknesses or those key performance inhibitors and then as it got kind of got closer to the season they would start to kind of focus again on those strengths of the athlete because they felt that like from a psychological standpoint it stood the athlete well and that well you know i worked all off season on my weaknesses they've all risen and they were just kind of putting a cherry on top like just spicing up my strengths again because i suppose a key thing is to that if someone does have a proclivity or an essence as james would say um that really is you know a key performance indicator for them in terms of it is what makes them who they are it is also important to to do a little bit of work there, maybe more so even just mentally ra- rather than so like physiologically or bringing that strength up from a capacity standpoint. But interested to get your thoughts on that. Like, yeah, I think that um, I'm a I'm a big fan of like building a base and earning uh, the right to to progress with momentum. And what I mean by that is that. Um, well, twofold. One, the typically the, the the people that I start working with, the first 90 days is like really, really tough for them. And the reason is, is because we've just honed in on all these weaknesses and that's mm-hmm. what we're attacking, mm-hmm. right? So they, you know, feel unfit. They feel slow. They feel weak. They feel like they're not good at something they used to be really mm-hmm. good at. I feel, un- un- really- I feel unathletic is the one I always go. I feel so unathletic. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Like, yeah, it's, like, so- it's like when you take the power lifter and start doing like single leg work and it's just like, Oh my God. Yeah. Why can't I? Yeah. Why exactly. Right. Like you just, um, 
it highlights the uh, you know all the shortcomings, and and that can be really tough for for a high level athlete that is looking to win, right? And so I think that um, that's a really really tough thing that happens, but it needs to happen. And what I've found is that um, uh, you know there has been a, a a small group of people that just can't can't deal with that, and then mm. they they find another coach, right? Um, which I'm I'm totally okay with in a way, but it, it, I think it speaks more to that, that, you know, the perseverance and that quality in a champion that is needed. Um, and really kind of, you know, uh, Carol DeWick's mindset book, right? Like yeah, fixed, fixed versus growth. growth. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, um, you know, having a growth mindset needs to occur because, um, if you need to be pacified with success all the time, um, you're going to limit your potential to grow. And Absolutely, yeah. so I, I think that, um, you know, that's one thing. I think the other, the, the comment I kind of opened up with about earning the, the right to like um, have momentum, meaning like a lot of people come untrained um, in from training systems that are undeveloped, right? Yeah. So yeah. the need to uh, increase volume slowly into an actual like working capacity to build resiliency to be able to recover uh and then to be able to add intensity isn't happen overnight right mm-hmm. and so um what that what that might look like is you, you gotta know, you gotta you, slow cook that shit yeah exactly and if you rush it you're gonna be screwed so i think like you know, I've seen like about 90 days, um, maybe two months is about right of like this consistent grind. Right. And that's like the off season, like people, yeah. off season is really tough for people. Right. Cause it's just a slow grind with not a lot of like, uh, like th- there's no light at the end of the tunnel in a way. Yeah. The, the feedback is an instant like, so yeah, it's uh yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it is hard for individuals who find it tough to delay gratification, but, um, the, uh, there was something else I was going to say to you there now. Something about uh, weaknesses, key performance inhibitors. It was there. But anyway, we can continue on there till I regain my thoughts. You, you were speaking. Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, yeah, so I think like when you take that into like the, the, the pre-season, the pre-competition season, uh, and then transitioning into like game day, like everybody's a little bit different, right? I think that you have some people who will never excel in training. Um, their numbers don't in training, they don't represent their, uh, true potential, their capacity, their, their, you know, their performance, but you put them on a, uh, you put them out on game day and they're like blowing, you know, they're PRing everything, they're blowing mm-hmm. everything away. Like, and, and then you have the other, uh, type of athlete and I'm generalizing, right. But you have someone who excels in training, um, and then gets out on game day and, you know, they'll be five pounds less than their PR, yeah, or the, yeah, you know, yeah. whatever, whatever it is. Right. And, and one isn't better than the other, but I do think that like becoming and being a game day athlete is really, really important to the success yeah. Uh, yeah. of that individual. And so um, that kind of goes into like, well, do you build confidence or do you not build confidence? I think it depends on which archetype you kind of fit into. Right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Big time. Yeah. And uh, sorry, yeah, well, my, I regained my thought there now and made a, a note of it just to be sure. What I was going to say to is, like, you know, you were saying that it can be very tough for an athlete in those initial, you know, 60 to 90 days to sort of like really buy into just working on their weakness. Because again, it, you know, it, it can make them feel so inferior to, to what they're used to feeling. And again, if all they ever work on is their strengths, well, then all they ever work on is, is something that gives them again, instant gratification rather than working on the weakness, which again is such a delayed gratification process. But I think from a coach's standpoint, this is the point I wanted to make was it really comes down to us as coaches, educating the athlete and how we, how we sort of, uh, shape their perception of that situation so like the way i would see it is like you know if you say to me like like think about it like think about how far you've gotten and you have so many gaps left to fill like how good you're going to be when these weaknesses like start to become strengths you know so when, i think when you if you can word it or change change the uh the perception in the athlete's mind of seeing these as obstacles and, and rather see them as opportunities like so like you know if they have such gaping weaknesses or big gaps within their sort of development and like you could say to them listen you've gotten this far 
and and you are this good and you have all this to, to work on like this is amazing like this is so imagine how good you can be like the potential that is still on the table here is incredible and i think if you got it across that they're like oh my god like i'm gonna be amazing so it's yeah. just you know, it can help with buying it so the big thing i'm trying to say is like it really comes down i think not really comes down but i think a large part of us as coaches is that education piece in in that how we can change their perception again kind of getting the athlete to change the mindset of oh this is a fucking massive obstacle to like whoa this is a fucking huge opportunity exactly and it's interesting it's like the whole idea of like nurture versus nature with that like the, do you does can you teach that right and mm-hmm. can you in truly instill it to where it becomes something that they 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 believe intrinsically or um or do they need to kind of be born with it and that's how they think right and i think obviously there's probably a mix of of, of both of them um but yeah i 100 percent agree yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing like the athletes that i've uh come across where um well like the you know the weightlifter i was talking about like when 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 he couldn't when this when this guy couldn't even power raise two and a half pounds right for for eight reps and the guys you know jerking close to 400 it's like man like he like his eyes lit up and he would he got so excited mm. about you know he's like oh my god imagine like imagine the possibilities right like <laughs> that is cool right um and then you ask yourself well how in god's name did that even happen but that's a whole different still <laughs> different uh, I, yeah, just, 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 just to mention uh, a previous mentor of yours and someone who I did look up to, but uh, I'd say Charles is, is looking down on us now, smiling. I yes, was, I, told, yeah. I told you, get that bell raise up and they'll press more. Exactly. He, he would say in that great Canadian accent. It's funny because on a, on a, a podcast with Mike uh, Kaju and James Fitzgerald, they mentioned Charles, and Mike says something really funny. He goes, "I just love the way that guy says a seal quarantine, a seal quarantine." The way he's <laughs> fucking <laughs> <laughs> guy. Now I, I can't do the impression at all, but it was so funny. A seal quarantine, really good. Uh, Charles, great man, great man. But yeah. uh, it's just one last thing there on that sort of delayed gratification thing too is uh, Chad Wesley Smith, who's, who's a good friend of mine, and I had him over here in Ireland one year himself and Brandon Eddy that came over to deliver a seminar. And obviously Chad is a very successful powerlifter. And, uh, you know, he w- is a big proponent of, you know, doing a lot of submaximal training, you know, and for a sport where the, the main sport is lifting them, you know, it is the sport of maximal strength, you know. It, so like, you know, um, being able to, to lift the most amount of load for one all-out rep in the squat bench and deadlift but yet a lot of his training the majority of it um you know obviously bar maybe the peaking cycles and even his peaking cycles were, were sub-maximal mostly to a degree people were always like you know how like how how's your training like how do you like trust your training process or like how is most of your training sub-maximal yet you get these amazing performance on the platform going back to this like not he, he, so basically he's not leaving his performance in the train on the training platform he brought brought it every day to competition as you were kind of talking about game day and uh his whole thing again was just like training is not testing so going back to this like instant gratification versus delayed gratification he's like how many times on social media people are like yeah just do the pr on like my squat my bench and, and like he'd be like and you're two weeks out from your meet what are you doing <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you've just left that in the gym now like you know more than lightly so like he he would constantly preach about you know this ability to trust the process delay gratification don't leave game day in the gym like or don't leave your platform performance in the gym and you know he he like he'd always put up videos like i think like and he he put up a post one time or it might be an article where he was saying like my best training squat bench deadlifts are this but yeah my best competitions are this and like there was a significant difference between them like as in like his competition maxes were way above his training maxes and like his whole point was like and that's the way it should be. Like, how many times have you seen, like, people say, well, my best squat is this in the gym, but my best in competition is, and it's always lower. And you're like, why couldn't you do, why, why, why couldn't you do that in competition? So, yeah, like, he, he, was trying, he was trying to make that point, too, that, you know, people, it, it, and it is probably just a, a mentality thing, you know, where people just get angsty, they're like, oh, fuck, am I getting weak? Will I be strong enough game day? Like, so his whole thing was, like, just about trusting the process, delay gratification, and, like, you know, show up on game, they don't leave it on the platform in training. Yeah, one thing I learned early on is is to try to find the the least stressful uh, tool to create change. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Sense. Yeah, I, I the exact same thing. Trying trying to get the biggest. It's like you know the 
the the biggest stimulus with the least amount of like cost to the system or that like you know you're yeah. trying to get the maximum adaptation with the least amount of cost to the system yeah and and you know it's funny that um there's uh so if you if you look at uh if you look at what most people think about right like it's known in in our sport that whatever you do you're going to get better at typically right so if you lift heavy you you're going to get heavy but the ironic thing is is if you look at it from a cellular level from a you know the, the human physiology like it doesn't we're not that smart right like it, it, you just need a you just need to stress a, a certain system just a little bit and it's going to adapt if that makes sense and the bigger the stress, the more recovery it's going to take to actually create that adaptation. And so I think that like you kind of mentioned it like that slow drip, right. And when we talk about long-term um, athletic development, like that actually needs to be in there. Louis Simmons, uh, funny guy, man. He, I, I never forget. He put it the, he, he put it, he put it in the words better than I've ever heard anybody. He's like, He's saying it doesn't matter. He's like, your body doesn't care whether, uh, whether it got beat up by a 200 pound gorilla or by a girl. Right? Your body just knows how beat up and it's going to change because of it and it's going to get better because of it. And I think that that's true, right? Like, why use that 200 pound gorilla when you don't need to? Yeah. So you, you broke out a little bit there. So, what Louis' example was a 200 pound gorilla or a, or a, a 10 year old girl. Or ten year old girl, yeah. yeah. You're, right. You're right, Louis is gas. I was I was at Westside three years ago and I got to meet the man. So uh, yeah, he's an absolute absolute legend. Bought, bought me breakfast, so mm. he's a really really nice dude. But uh, and he's hilarious too. But again, like uh, he's you know he's he's someone we owe an awful lot. To. I know like a lot of people have criticism for him, but again, like we we do owe an awful lot to Louis. He he definitely pioneered a lot of stuff and and he's had some great ideas and fairness to him. But yeah, he's a great guy, great guy. Have you ever been to Westside? I have not. No, no, you should go. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's it's it is. It's a great place. But uh, his right hand man, like the guy who looks after basically everything for him, is an Irish man, Tom um, Tom Barry. He's from Kilkenny here in Ireland, so I'd have good con- good contact there with Tom. Obviously, being a fellow Irish man. But uh, nice, man. another question I'd like to ask, but we're running a little bit short on time, so we we might do it another day. Is like. How do you monitor the training process then? Because um, I have a few other questions here I want to get through. So if, that, if this question is going to be a, you know, if you think you need like a, a good long answer to it, we, we can attack it another day. But like, do you, do you use RPE? Do you use HRV? Do you, like how much of it's conversation with the athlete? Um, so what, what are you doing from that standpoint? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of all of it, right? So like all the pieces go into creating a big picture. I think that conversations with the athletes are – some of the most important, um, the people who train on site with me, um, having people kind of move from all over to train on site. And that's a huge, like huge advantage because they walk in the gym, you can look them in the eye and, and know if something's not right. Um, and then that leads to a conversation, uh, remotely, it becomes a little bit more challenging because, uh, everyone needs to be a little bit more emotionally intelligent, um, and communicate better, including myself. So it's like asking the right questions, um, and really relying on saying, Hey, like, Hey, how are you feeling today? And understanding that if they're not feeling great, it, it doesn't mean anything. Right. Um, so not putting meaning towards it. Um, HRV, I think is a good, a good tool. Um, it, I think, um, the whoop is a really interesting, um, interesting different standpoints. I think the heart rate monitoring, uh, piece it's not great um but i think as a way to start conversations about lifestyle with the athlete is fantastic so it'll bring awareness around sleep recovery to the athlete and so just having that awareness and it being more on the mind of that athlete change will most likely occur also if something's not right it pings me to say hey like how are things going right when i wouldn't have normally like maybe asked them like hey how's sleep going or uh, how's family life or you know those sorts of things so i think it's a good tool do you get your athletes to like track that and send it to you like in a spreadsheet or anything like that like sleep um or? yeah so whoop has a has a i don't know what they call it um i'm just privileged enough to be on like i, I created a team and so essentially yeah, like, like a dashboard 
Yeah, basically. And I see all my athletes and all my athletes can see everybody else. So like, it's oh, kind of funny because if someone's good. like, doesn't get much sleep, like you'll get the other athletes kind of like nudging yeah, yeah, them yeah. saying, hey, yeah. like big night last night, like ha 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 kind of. So it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> That's gas. But also too, you can make competition out of that. Like, you know, I got eight hours, you got seven. I'm beating the motherfucker. In terms yeah. Of and competition. it also goes the other way too. Cause I think like right now there's like, I think one one percent recovered is like the lowest or like two percent maybe and everyone's like oh i wonder if we'll ever see a one like what happens when you get to zero you die like um that's gas kind of thing. But it's, yeah so who knows but yeah and i think i think just training right like um understanding uh, having a syst- sophistication around uh and a deeper understanding of why you're developing and structuring cycles the way you're you're writing them is really really important because if something doesn't go as expected it's a cue to ask questions of saying okay well why why hasn't it gone you know well and i think that that actually is probably one of the best athlete monitor systems only because it helps you monitor yourself as a coach if that makes sense like I think one of the biggest advantages, a lot of people program a week at a time, a couple of days at a time. And, and I tend to do that, but I do write um, bigger skeletons that cover months at a time. Um, I might even write a cycle that, um, that is, you know, maybe two, three, four weeks ahead. And what I learned early on is that that's really valuable because you're putting yourself out there for yourself saying, okay, this is the plan. This is what I think is going to happen. And then you let it happen for four weeks. And at the end you're like, okay, well what happened? And you're like, Oh man, like that didn't go as planned or like, Oh wow. Like things. And then, then you start uh, being able to identify trends um, with certain types of people and, and you start uh, being accountable to yourself uh, a little bit more. And I think that that's one of the best tools uh, out there, honestly, is, 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 taking that risk planning ahead for yourself as a coach mm, good stuff. Uh, and then just maybe a final one of that is do you use any form of auto regulation uh, in terms of like it's just a, a subjective rpe or do you use any like velocity based stuff in in terms of probably this would be more so in like any of the strength pieces involved in like um any of the power lifts because it's kind of hard to use rp with weightlifting but you, you could use rp too on some of the metabolic pieces too but yeah do you, do you use any form of auto reg and the reason why i asked that is too, you you probably know uh, evan piken and um, yeah he's in training think like we had a good conversation about this in terms of auto regulation now it was our conversation was around like you know basically strength development you know so whether you know again doesn't really matter the tool, but say you were doing sets of squats or deadlifts or benching or whatever. And basically instead of like saying, well, we'll just do five sets of five today, but how do you know like that guy or girl, they needed like eight sets of five to get the adaptation that day, or maybe the, another day it was only four sets of five because depending on where they were as an organism that day, like, so Evan's speaking that he's gone a lot more towards auto-regulation because he gave like this outrageous example of, he said he one of his athletes and like he's like this guy is strong like he had he had like a, a max squat like in the high 500s or something like that i think but he's strong anyway and one day he did like double 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 figure sets of fives uh at over 85 percent of his squat and like most people hear that and they'll think oh this guy must be a weak guy type one fiber and he can do a lot of like high percentage of his one close to his one rm do you know what i mean but everyone's like no this guy like was strong like he's definitely not his essence isn't like a slow twitch guy like he, he's basically basically like he's like most people say this guy has a uh, low uh neuromuscular efficiency and he's like he you know this guy is from a neural standpoint is, is fairly strong like he'd be actually more towards a type two and yet at 85 percent of his max in the squat he was able to do like double figures of fives like and most people would say like that's impossible and he's like bevan's like i've seen this so he's kind of speaking towards more like this is probably why auto regulation is a better model to go to in terms in, yeah, terms, I, of, in terms of that example now anyway yeah yeah and i agree i think that auto regulation is something that that i i unless i know the athlete really really well um most of it's auto regulated like six to eight reps at you know you know whatever. Uh, and then I just have to, you know, it takes a little bit more time coaching the athlete and getting the athlete yeah, to be yeah. 
intelligent, right? So knowing that if they consistently, if you give them six to eight reps, for instance, and they consistently get eight reps, they're not going heavy enough, right? But then also letting them understand that, you know, if they didn't sleep well the day before, you know, if they had a big day to day before uh, training day, then they're going to show up. And if you did prescribe 87%, you know, it would, it, it, it's arbitrary, right? It's so subjective. And yeah. I think it's interesting. Evan's example just goes to show like how, how little we know about Oh, not um, what we're doing right yeah because yeah. because um, he because sorry to interrupt as well because the example he's also given to he's like you know you you look at the classic <laughs> perlipins chart and everyone's like you can only do these amount of reps and this amount of total reps with this amount of percentage and it's just like well first of all that chart was made for elite level olympic weightlifters <laughs> who were on a shit right. ton of fucking juice as well and he's, yep. and he's just like and he's just like it, it like to take that and apply that to everyone is just like and, and you're right though sorry to interrupt you're right we know we basically know fuck all like yeah. And that's the thing. It needs to be, uh, I think, empirically driven to some degree, right? Like you look at an individual and you say, Hey, I'm going to give you eight reps uh, and see what happens. Right. And then yeah. saying, Oh, that worked or that didn't work. Right. And then you, you constantly come up with theories, implement your theories, and then you are left to interpreting the data. And I think that the more we realize that the better coaches we're going to be, right? Like I have, um, you know, I, I coached, Kara um, to the games last year and, and she like the training that she came from historically was low volume training once a day and it and it totally just kind of shook my world I was like well how does this person get this strong doing this and it just it didn't make sense now there was a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, potential on the left on the table to improve upon but still like something like that I'm like wow and so yeah, that kind of goes back what? to what we touched on earlier on. You must be like, holy crap, imagine the potential. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, completely. Um, yeah, so I think that, uh, yeah, Evan's, Evan's, I think, on to something. And that's, uh, if I know an athlete really well, I will give them percentage. Um, but it usually takes a long time uh, to to get to know it, right? Get to yeah. know that those. And um, but you're even using like an RPE. It isn't. It isn't something you, you want to use with a beginner reader because again, they just they, they don't have the training knowledge built up to really know how to utilize RPE either. But it's funny actually you mentioned six eight reps there, like the, the brackets because I, I I utilize rep brackets too, which in and of itself is sort of an auto regulation. But it's as I've matured more as a coach, the more I've kind of gone to like you know, given a bracket sets and rep range and kind of, you know, educating the individual. And usually in fairness, I suppose like, I suppose most coaches may resonate with this. It's kind of like when you have a beginner, you're a lot more uh, um, prescriptive. You're like, just do this and this. <laughs> yeah, just do this and this. Like you're like more exact, like just do four sets of eight or whatever, you know, like kind of with a, with, a, with a beginner. Whereas someone who has that intermediate to more advanced sort of training age, you can be, you know, you can be a little more, um, a facilitator in that process whereas what i was about to say was as i matured more as a coach i sort of left a little more open-ended like you might say like you know three to five sets of like six to ten reps and if it's if you're feeling great today go at the higher end of that volume if you're not feeling so hot go the lower end of that volume volume range you know so kind of giving a built-in auto regulation that's just an example i'm just saying but or also as i like what mike Toshir does in terms of Toshir would say like and he, suppose, is one of the sort of guys who's really popularized the RP model. And we spoke about it at length. Uh, he kind of has this model, like the fatigue-based model. So he might say after you work up to a top load, and, and that top load might be at a 9 out of 10, whatever it is. And then he'd say, right, strip off like 5 to 10% of that top load and keep hitting this number of reps for sets until you it gets again to another 9 out of So like so it gets to another 9 out of 10. So like you might build up to like a set of 5 let's say 160 kilo squat and that was nine out of 10 and he'd say right take about 10 percent off that squat now and keep hitting sets of five until the rp gets back up to a nine so like you might you might hit so he calls them kind of sort of back off or down sets so you could end up one day if, if you're feeling great you might end up hitting an extra four or five six maybe even seven extra back off sets because your body was able to handle that stimulus whereas on a day where you're feeling really tired it might have just been your top set one more additional set with 10% off, like I'm done. You know, so yeah. You might, yeah. So like that, that's one way he utilized, which I found very uh, intuitive and very intelligent, you know, because again, it, it just like what Evan sort of sp sparked in my mind and, and even just what Mike to share is that like, because humans are such dynamic fluid organisms and, and we're, you know, we're so different on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, the stimulus that is needed for you to adapt 
in one specific moment, we'll just say a day for, for, for the brevity of this conversation. So the stimulus needed for you to adapt that day is so different to the, to the stimulus that you need at, a, at another t- another moment in time or another day so like it could be a lot less one day due to like lifestyle factors because again maybe your ability to adapt is has been compromised by poor sleep you had a row with someone there's just more fucking glucocorticoids floating in your bloodstream from a row you had the day before and then vice versa another day like your system's like i can handle a shit ton because i have calories in me i'm sleeping great life is wonderful i'm in love with someone so you might be like it's gonna take 10 sets of five today whereas in the shitty days like you get the three sets of five with the same load and you're like nope not today i don't have the reserves to adapt so i just i just find a whole like we really just don't know how to prescribe volumes like we don't like mike israel came out with a book there this year called how much should i train and like it is actually it's it's like you think you think it's such a simple question to answer Mm. but yet it's so complicated and like how much should i train it's like we really don't know (laughs) Because yeah. you, you were so such a dynamic organism changing on such like a, a moment-to-moment basis that like the volume needed for your body to adapt to a particular stimulus one day is so difficult. Now, obviously, there's general ranges and ballparks, but to really nail it down, we probably never can. And I, I, I know I said there earlier on a few min- minutes ago, like we really know fuck all when it comes to sort of just training and exercise and, and the whole game of fitness. Like I, I hope people don't take take my message as something negative because i think that is amazing like I'm, I'm excited by that like we know so little it's so good like there's yeah, so much on. more to 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 get into like anyway yeah. I'm, I'm speaking too much here and uh i'll uh, let you uh expand more your thoughts there and then we'll wrap up yeah no i love it i mean i think um like that that goes into this idea of like be, becoming a perpetual student right and like if as a coach you're, you don't have that kind of perpetual student mindset you're you know you're going to be left behind and you're going to be you know kind of yeah you're just going to miss out on on all the, the great stuff that that you could learn and i think um i i've come to find that uh with the actually the elite athletes i get almost very specific again right so like i think uh with the beginners yeah like specific so there's not a lot of thought in there um and they just need time right and then the intermediate advanced like i think that there's a little bit more like wiggle room um and I think there's a little bit more, like it's a little bit more complex. I think when you get to elite athletes, when I'm talking professional athletes, when uh, living, breathing, sleeping, training is their job and they can literally uh, go in and uh, dictate exactly the routine and timing of everything in that day, then um, becoming very specific, I think is important as an indicator to what is working, what is not, right? Like those are the types of folks that if I just say, oh, do three to five sets, um, or I'm very vague, um, it's really hard to understand and see trends over the course of four, eight, 12 weeks, right? Versus like, if I'm very specific about the increase in volume, right? Um, Like I've found that for, you know, let's say most people can handle about 3% increase in load from session to session, um, assuming full recovery, things like that. That's kind of a number that I've seen. Right. So like if I, if I, you know, predict that for somebody and then something happens, I'm like, okay, 3% is too aggressive. Right. Or something like that. But if it's a range, then it's really, really hard to get specific. And when you talk about elite athletes, I think the specificity is really, really important because the changes that we're trying to elicit, are so um, um, so specific, right? um, but it's hard, I think. And then that's where, if you don't have the experience, the knowledge, the expertise, um, willing to uh, it's really hard to that what needs to be done. Sorry, Nick, you're you're breaking up there pretty bad. So. Yeah, it was I? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe my internet's uh, not, no, you, you not liking me today. You were just uh, no, say that last piece again there. So you were saying you just finished off with like uh, being very specific there with the elite. Yeah, so I just think that with elite athletes, we're trying to elicit very specific changes. And so in order to know exactly what's working and what's not working, the ability to be as specific as possible is is yeah. needed. 
right? Yeah. We're yeah. talking about eliciting like a, a half a percent change in, you know, in some somebody's like oxygen uptake and local muscle endurance or something like that. Like having a progression and putting yourself out there and knowing to some certainty what you're doing and why you're doing it to either confirm it's working or not, then that is when you're talking about elite athletes, I, I believe that that's what's needed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I, I understand where you're coming from, but I, again, it's just that we can't like, we literally just can't be that like, we're trying to be as objective as, as possible, but we still, it's impossible. Like, you know, to, to, to actually, because of the human 100% organism that we're dealing with like because uh i know just like working with the elite level sprinters at altus like with dan and Stu, and being around them boys like they were very much about having ranges for things again like because they were just like they could show up one day and they might be able to hit you know th- these amounts of accelerations and, and stay within this type, type of time zone he's like other days will come in and they're dropping off like after only you know a few accelerations like time to call it no yeah. good but I look at that as uh, uh, open-mindedness and flexibility within yeah. what you've written, right? I think, I think that that is definitely needed, um, especially the, the higher you get in terms of, um, you know, uh, when we talk about elite athletes. Uh, but I, I just think that, like, what, as a coach with elite athletes, we need to, in, in our prescriptions, we need to be as specific as possible, right? Um, doesn't mean that you had to adhere to it Mm. Uh, through the eight weeks and ignore everything that's going on i just think that um you know if you if you have a range you know saying hey i'm trying to do um you know five things and then you know you have five uh different data points that are going to intersect that's going to make it that much harder to say hey is this working or yeah, is this not? yeah. I, know, I know what you're saying we're, we're always trying to yeah. control as many variables as possible like yeah, um, big time, big time, man. Uh, I have just some really quick fire around questions. If you if you're okay for those, yeah, go for it, go for it. What would you say have been the biggest lessons you've learned so far in your life? Oh my goodness. Um, or the biggest one. Biggest lesson, I think. Um, manage energy and not time. Hmm. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I think for so long, I tried to manage my time and, and trying to create more time in my life and, uh, you know, look, uh, look at the things, the projects, the, the, you know, activity as I was doing in, in terms of time. And what I realized is that it's more about energy. So something could take much more time from me. Uh, but, require less energy um and you know so so i I feel like the biggest negative impact to my uh being productive to uh happiness to being content to being you know just a good father person friend coach is um you know is energy you know when when something costs me a lot of energy i really need to look at that um because the consequences are huge right it, the ripple yeah. effect in my life is pretty big big time what um what no actually this one i was gonna ask the yes how do you learn how do i learn i What's learn process oh man um i think it's i think it's threefold one um auditory so like i listen to a lot of books on tape podcast information and um, usually application so like something will re- resonate with me and it'll kind of like get incorporated to what i'm doing um and so that the application process is is really important to me because then i can actually see it touch it feel it under try to understand it uh if that makes sense and then also um the, the one of the biggest ways I learn is in risk. Um, mm. Obviously, there's there's certain things that I'm willing to risk and, and certain things I'm not willing to risk uh, and be more risky in. But when I take a risk, um, I'm usually doing something out of my comfort that's new. And, you know, if I fail or I succeed, I learn the most during those those types of situations. 
Yeah, very good, very good. What would you say is your top resource to anyone who's listening to this? And the resource could be any, it could be a book or a podcast or a course, an online course, you know, a, a, a person, a mentorship, anything. And it doesn't, wow. it, doesn't, it, doesn't um, have, it doesn't have to be limited to coaching, let's say it could be anything. Yeah. Um, man, I think the biggest resource, I, I don't, I don't think there is any one. I think, I think for anybody out there, like if you don't have a coach, you, you find a coach mm. hands down um, because that person becomes one of your biggest resources. And if that coach is good, um, then you know that's just the anchor point to everything else in your life meaning nutrition mindset like books yeah. to read podcasts to listen to um you know structuring your life like i think just having a coach and using i mean that's why i love like uh i love coaching uh because we can anchor training in somebody's life to elicit change uh holistically like through and through so um, it's a little generic, but I think like if that's you don't good. have a coach, you need to get a coach. Yeah, coach or or a mentor. Yeah, it's good. It is good. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, is there anything you do on a daily basis that is very important to your day? So any daily ritual that you, that's crucial to this to the success of your day? Yeah, my coffee. <laughs> no, you're, you're, um, you're like Stu, Stu McGill's the same. You said coffee. Yeah. No, I I think. Um, Yeah. So uh, the, the, usually the evening before I write a list of, I update my list of things that I need to do. Um, so I have two lists. I have like, well, three, I guess I have like a project list. Um, then I have a list of things that I need to accomplish in the week. And then I have a list of things that, that I like deadlines. Right. So um, usually the deadlines uh, items I leave to like the middle of the day. Um, and then I, so I, I make sure never to wake up and do a deadline item. Um, unless, unless it's like, you're very Absol rarely, but absolute like, deadline, yeah. like 9 a.m. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I do, I do what I want to do. Right. Like, and then that's part of managing energy, right? Like if I'm, if I'm inspired to be creative in the morning, which I usually am, then I, I take that time to, to do that. Um, and so, so I usually, you know, get up coffee. I usually have like a, a 90 to two hour uh, kind of fasted uh, work session um, and then um, eat breakfast. And then I get into the grind of like, okay, what do I need to do today? And that's part of that's emails. And I mean, you saw my autoresponder, right? So yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you train fasted? Like, do you do your, like even in like intense sessions fasted? No, no way. No, <laughs> I would die. No, you know, I mean, it, how, how, how long, yeah. how long do you say those sessions in the morning were? The work sessions, not training sessions. Oh, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Work sessions. Yeah. I training. No training. I, I don't, I don't train fasted. No, I, th I thought, that's, I thought, that's, I thought you said, uh, I thought you said a session as in like 90 minutes session. I was like fast. What the fuck are you doing there for 90 minutes? Yeah, no. <laughs> Unless like, it's like cardiac output, like just like walking on a treadmill or something like that. That's why I was asking. No, but I, I, mean, exactly. so I get you now. I get you now. You're doing work. Exactly. work. Yeah. 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 As in like, yeah, like, yep. Uh, so uh, in just touching off that what what is your training looking like these days um it's almost uh like just a functional um structural strength program with easy breathing uh mobility based movement based nothing nothing specific um you know with a goal intent in, in mind i i do um so i'm two two climbs away from getting a hundred uh, L cap a sense. Um, and that's something that's been on my mind for a couple of years. And so what, what, what does that mean, Nick now for people? Who so, yeah. So L, El Capitan is, um, a 3,500 foot vertical rock face in Yosemite national park. If you don't know what it is, go Google it. You see a million photos of it. Um, and people spend, I don't know, probably average of four to four to seven days, four to six days climbing it. So vertical camping in a way. Um, and my goal has always been to have a hundred, uh, like one day ascents up L cap. So I have like 98, uh, in a push. Some of them have been like over 24 hours technically, but 
the idea is just I, I want to be able to climb two more. Um, and so my training is a little bit with that in mind and, and kind of what I need. A work family is a uh, priority and then probably an assemblance of nutrition and training last. So it kind of, kind of falls in, in, in there. <laughs> Yeah, Daddy, great stuff. Last three for you. Uh, your top and current book recommendations. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I think the my top book, let's see. I think that A Short History of Nearly Everything oh, cool. by Bill Bryson is, is a really, really cool book. Um, yeah, I think that it's not, it's not, fitness or uh, uh you know related in any way but um in but, terms of it uh, doesn't doesn't have to be and i'm actually happy when it's not people always start measure oh, science and practice and training and super training. Like, okay yeah, come yeah. On. <laughs> give me something here give me something else yeah that's, that's yeah the question. short history of nearly everything is, is like fantastic um uh, i don't know things like uh i'll write into a series um uh dan carlin right the the uh, um with uh hardcore history yeah hardcore history um i'm on that um yeah with genghis khan it's like a eight hour uh history lesson on genghis khan which is amazing so like that's that's how i'm spending probably the next week is listening to uh you know yeah, how he yeah. took over the world he's such a good storyteller to his voice is fucking class dan carlin's yeah he's great to listen to last two for you okay elon musk has managed to uh, get humans off the the planet earth and uh, you only have one year left before you have to leave. So what would you do with that one year on Earth and why? How would you spend that one year? So you've only one year left on Earth. How would you spend it and why? Um, I would... Man. Uh, and so no one's left on Earth? Well, you're leaving in a year. But And everybody else is left here? E, not everyone else. Some people are gone. Some people aren't. Like it's just Elon Musk has said, "Listen, people can go if they want, and you, for whatever reason, you've decided I'm going to leave." And uh, okay. Anyway. Yeah, I think I would. I would try to catalog and like my knowledge, my experiences, and then be able to give it to people who are left here. It's one of the things. But other than that, I, I probably would. I mean, obviously, like spend more time with my my family, but I wouldn't change much to be honest with you. Yeah, um, cool. I mean, I'm in the process of trying to catalog. You know everything i think i know anyways so probably just happen quicker <laughs> great stuff all right last one the big one uh and uh just uh, what i'll say before i ask just be as authentic as you can in the moment because a lot of people get freaked out by this and they start like panicking like because they won't give it like a, 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 a like a like the most outstanding answer ever but anyway i'm in salt lake city and i'm gonna bring you for dinner and, I, and i'm bringing my bag of magical powers which allows me to bring people back from the dead if i have to and i say nick we're going for dinner and you can bring five people to dinner dead or alive who, who are you going to bring to the dinner and why um i'd probably bring my family so you'd be hanging out with my girls for sure because they're just awesome um now, just so you know, uh, spouses and kids don't count, so you still have five guests. Oh, now you're throwing in rules like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, uh, probably Charles Poliquin, uh, like Ido Portal. Nice. Um, I think Louis Simmons. Probably like... Uh, who else? Who else? Um there's a Russian weightlifting coach. I can't remember. It's like, is it? Borshenko? Yes, Borsh. Exactly. I would invite him. Um, is that, that's four or five. Yeah, that's four. That's four. And yeah. Only be, yeah. And only because from a, from a, from a conversation standpoint, that would be fascinating. Right, like imagine Ido Portal talking with Louis Simmons. I think that would just be amazing. There's a video of Louis and Borshenko speaking together. You know, the bike Chico was at Westside. Oh really? I'll oh, yeah. have to look it up. Yeah, I'll send it to you. It's very, it is interesting. It's gas because there's a bit in it where like she goes like, when we get close to competition, like someone's interpreting in front of me. He's like, when we get close to competition, we get really specific. And Louis's like, really? We do the opposite. We bring our general work up, and it's just like, it's just funny to do them talking. That's funny. Yeah. You've one more. That's, that's a, yeah, that's who I would bring. You've one more. Oh, I have one more. You said four yeah. to five, no? 
No, four um, or five, five. So you have Charles, Ido, Louis, uh, Boris Chico, and you've got one more. Oh man! So I just, I just started a book, and it's called "Running for My Life," and I can't remember the individual's name, but he's, he's, um, let's see, he's from Uganda. Uh, it's a great book, um, and he, so he's trying to break the two-hour marathon. Oh and he yes, just ran yes. like a two-hour, one minute, thirty-five seconds, or something. Anyways, his the book is about his life and cataloging his his you know, just an amazing life. And I'd probably invite him. I, I can't remember his name. Um, Don't worry, I'll put the I'll put the show notes. Yeah, but yeah, I would I would invite him. Uh, I think yeah, he's still yeah. alive. So, yeah. Good stuff. Great stuff. Nick, thanks so much for making time and. Uh, yeah, I'll just wrap up here and I'll say goodbye to you offline. So as I say to a lot of the, or as I end a lot of my podcast now lately, I tell the listeners, you're spoiled. You're getting all this information for free. Very spoiled. <laughs> Very lucky. But listen, thanks so much for making time. I really do appreciate it. And for everyone who's listening, uh, take care and I'll talk to everyone soon. Peace. Fantastic.